Are you a budding cannabis business owner? Do you currently own a license or in the process of receiving one and need help with taking your business to the next level? Tap Peak Relief Consultations. From licensing and staffing to seed to sale, Peak Relief uses their expertise in the industry to take your brand to the next level. Don't waste your valuable time spinning your wheels. Let Peak Relief Consultations ensure your can of dreams don't go up in smoke. Bump into you Saturday. I didn't get a chance to see you speak because I literally, I've been, I was, by that moment you had saw me, I was up from like the Friday morning because we had an event prior to that, to that moment. So I had to fall yeah. out. But I heard you did great. Thank you. And you won a trophy too, will you? Entrepreneur yeah, of the Year? Yeah, I got Entrepreneur of the Year. It's great to be recognized, yeah, you know? Always, always, always. Yeah. So for those who might not recognize you or don't know you, um, state your name and tell us what you do. So my name is Hope Wiseman. I am the owner of Marion, Maine, which is a medical cannabis dispensary in Capitol Heights, Maryland. Um, and since, you know, I've been deemed the youngest African-American woman to own yeah. a dispensary in the United States. Yeah. So, yeah. That's a lofty title, too. It is. It's very yeah. long. Mm -hmm. And it's also just like <laughs> it's actually heavy, too, yeah. to actually carry that responsibility. Too. It really is. And I want to speak about that later because that's one of them titles you, you might luckily or unluckily hold for another 10 years. You know, I just, mean, I hope not. I, just, I was thinking about that myself. Like, I really hope she's not the youngest probably by next year. But there's a really good chance that's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because it's only getting more difficult. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so. Mm -hmm. so you might be reigning champ of that for a little while. But we, <laughs> we'll discuss that later. Um, so talk to us about how you end, end up in cannabis in the first place. Because you yeah. started out, like most people, actually in corporate America. Mm -hmm. um, so talk to us about that transition. What made you leave corporate America and the finance, world of finance and come over here where we smoke weed and talk a lot of that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was... Um, I was in college. I went to college down here in Atlanta. I went Spelman. to Spelman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was an economics major. Um, and all throughout school, I was interning at investment banks. And ultimately, I ended up working at an investment bank down here in Atlanta, okay. SunTrust Robinson Humphrey. I was doing equity institutional sales, which is pretty much like selling stock research to uh, mutual fund managers okay. and hedge fund managers, people running those funds. <laughs> Sound like something that's about to be on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, like yeah, like about to be all on that Netflix. stuff. <laughs> like I was really kind of in that world yeah. now. Um, kind of what people think of Wall Street, though, is, is a little... It's it's a little exaggerated. It's more yeah. true of like what Wall Street was back in like the 80s. Mm -hmm. It's definitely calmed down now, um, but it's still very intense. It's long hours, um, very, very difficult. Um, they expect you to perform at really, really high levels yes. um, at a young age. And that's so stressful, I believe. It's extremely yeah, stressful. Yeah, it's very difficult. And, you know, a lot of the kids that I was interning with and then ultimately working with full time were coming out of Harvard, Penn, Stanford. So, you know, coming from Spelman, I, I definitely felt like I deserved to be there. But mm -hmm. just like the actual level of knowledge that I had around finance, yeah. you know, I was an economics major. I wasn't a finance major. So um, it was difficult for me to keep up with those kids, but it definitely taught me how to be tenacious and um, how to get around situations and, and teach myself. Really? You know, I wouldn't look at it as a situation where you thought you had to catch up with, with the Harvard Penn students, but you know, I was in Rose and I know that yeah. they, they're really like an intense group of people themselves. Yeah. Yeah, so. <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> yeah. So, so, but what led you to cannabis of all things? Like you could have quit and become a yoga instructor or done a lot of things. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that would have never happened. But, yeah. um, you know, so what really drew me to cannabis yeah. was just the huge economic opportunity of oh, this of industry yeah. at first that was the very first thing that draw my, drew my attention so remember I was an econ major in mm -hmm. school um, I had just started working full-time at SunTrust so I'm down in Atlanta I'm getting up every day at like 4 45 um, to get to work by like 5 45 and I mean I'm working until like 6 and 7 Sheesh. and that's um, traffic is up early yeah. in Atlanta well I moved my butt <laughs> right next door to where we lived I good, literally used to good. walk across the street that traffic is um, real because yeah I can't do the traffic but 5 45 in the morning it's not mm. that much traffic um, but you know I just remember waking up every morning I was so sad like I just I was unhappy I, it just really wasn't where I wanted to be but I remember one day watching CNBC and I remember watching um, them talk about cannabis in the industry and they were talking about the growth of the industry and I was just so amazed by the fact that the industry had double digit growth every year for like the past five years mm -hmm. and it was barely legal in the US. So yeah. we're talking about back in 2014 at this point. Okay. 
Um, so I just remember thinking, and remember I was an econ major, so I just graduated, and I remember looking at, you know, I was looking at, I was studying multiple different industries over the years, you know? So then I'm looking, I'm like, that's not normal. Mm-hmm. Double digit growth for the past five years, mm-hmm. and it's barely even legal sounds here in like the a US. Scam. Sound like a scam, right? Yeah, I'm like, what is that? <laughs> Fear and scheme. I start paying attention, and I'm like, oh, this is gonna be huge. And then I start looking at the projections, and back in 2014, they were saying that the cannabis industry would be around by now it'd be like a oh maybe a billion dollar industry Past we're already that. at like 12 yeah. 13 14 15 billion dollars now yeah you know they're projecting 75 100 billion by 2025 at this point you know so the growth hasn't stopped that's what initially got me interested in cannabis and that's what got my my juices flowing about it. That's a ridiculous amount of growth too, because I remember it might have been last year that almost every month I get a press release talking about how much money was made in Colorado. Yeah. And after a while, it just started adding up to. I'm like, are they at a hundred million already? Like, I mean, were they like a billion dollars already? Like, yeah, midway through the, the state year? is in a surplus. At Jesus, this point. yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Well, you caught it at the right time. You know, mm-hmm. we're we're in a space now where we're, we're people are still trying to trickle in. They're still trying to learn and uh, enough to find themselves into the business. But you found your way in and you brought your mom with you. Yeah. Like, how did that work? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I like to think of it more like I didn't bring my mom with me. My mom put me up on her shoulders and allowed me to be who I am. Oh, man. That's like a word right there. <laughs> yeah. Like, it, I didn't do anything for her. She did everything for me. Um, but so when I first, I remember after like really being intrigued about the industry from mm-hmm. a business perspective, because I'd always believed in cannabis, you know, from a medicinal and adult use perspective, I yeah. thought that it should be legal and all of that. Um, but I didn't really look at it from the economic perspective. I didn't really understand the industry. So once I did, um, the first person I thought of to go to with the idea was my mother. Mm -hmm. I was raised, uh, to be an entrepreneur. My mother is an entrepreneur. She owns her own dental practice as well as multiple properties and has tried a lot of different business ventures growing up. My mom started her dental practice the year I was born. Mm -hmm. So I was six months old in a crib while my mom is (laughs) like literally, I mean, I've seen pictures of all that. I've been with my mom since day one. So you was growing while she was working. yeah, Yeah. Yeah. And she taught me how to run businesses from day one. So when I went to her, I was like, mom, I have this awesome opportunity. It's going to be huge. I think that we can build some generational wealth through this. And I presented her with the idea, and she was like, let's do it. I mean, it didn't really take much convincing at all. That's what I was about to say. That's cool as hell. So your mother, she did, it didn't take a whole lot of convincing. No. Was she already um, cannabis-friendly prior no, to that? Wow. not at all. Like, And I don't even think my mom really knew that I used cannabis at that time. Mm. She had no idea. I remember. Does she know now? Is she finding out now? Yeah. I mean, of course she does now. Um, yeah, now she does. But and, and my mom is is open to cannabis use. My mom has gone through some health scares. Okay. And she's used cannabis um, in substitute of other medicines. And we've been able to see firsthand how cannabis can really be an alternative uh, medication. And I really, truly believe, I know even a lot of adult use uh, or recreational users, sometimes they're like, eh, cannabis is not, you know, it's not real medicine. No, it's real medicine. Truly and I got is. to see my mom who never used cannabis. She says she tried, she smoked some weed when she was like 16 or something, you know, but like she, she never really ever used it and it really made all the difference my mom went through a whole cancer scare look i really applaud you and your moms because when i first told my mom about well she found out i was smoking weed like matter of fact shout out to my girl charity who's a spellman and she's a spellman alum too me and her used to come to the house high as hell we was in college (laughs) and we would eat all the food and i remember one day my mom said yo why y'all keep coming in here just eating up everything at 2 a.m and she said y'all smoking that weed ain't (laughs) y'all but even now kind of speaking to her is kind of odd about it because when i first told her i was doing the show and i was working on the documentary her first reaction was don't get arrested like right. that was her very first reaction was i pray you don't get arrested doing this and i'm like mom's first amendment and she's like you gonna get arrested and but now she's up she's actually more open to it now like she actually called me probably last year and um she had read a story that somebody did about me and she calls okay so i was reading about you and i got some questions i was like what's the question <laughs> she says is this why they was messing with ray charles back in the day like because of the whole cannabis thing and all this and i was like yeah kind of sort that's why they yeah all that yeah. kind of tied in she still ain't with it but <laughs> I mean, it takes a lot of convincing. Yeah. I had family members that um, really didn't understand what me and my mom were doing. I remember my grandmother, my mother's mother, I tried to like show her weed one time and I like had it in my hand. And yeah. I mean, I think she thought she was going to like die off of like. I tried to imagine my mom doing that. Yeah, she'd have been like, what the hell are you doing? I mean, my grandma was like, ah, oh, 
don't show me that. You know, like, don't get that away from me. But, you know, it's it's funny how now that, you know, kind of the the open public has accepted me um, as an established businesswoman, as I've been, like, brought in to speak more at conferences and all that stuff, now all of a sudden my family's like, wow. Oh, yeah. We're so proud of you. I'm like, I've only been doing this for the past five years. Tell but them. that's okay. I'm entrepreneur of the, year, <laughs> of the year, though, this year. Mm-hmm. That's what's up. So what's the, um, So what do you feel like has been the biggest challenges you face um, being in business so far? Yeah, um, I hate to sound redundant because I feel like this is like the one that always comes up that everyone says, but definitely access to capital. Oh, yeah. yeah um, that's definitely the most difficult. Um, I and my, my business partner, so my mother, and we have a third co-founder, um, and the three of us, we bootstrapped everything up until pretty much this point. Good. Um, which was great, right? Because yeah, we were able to build value, and now we can go out and raise money and not have to sell our souls. Mm. Um, but it gets really difficult. There's no banking access. You can't go take out a small business loan. Um, the loans that are available in the cannabis industry are normally extremely high interest rates. And most of the time you're not making a lot. You're not, uh, your cash flow is not, is not really, uh, at a point where you can take loans. No. And you I'm, know, you're not profiting. So you can't really take loans what um, I, in the beginning. What I find too, is you got to be skeptical. You almost got to be um, cautious about who you take money from. Yeah. And it reminds me again about the music industry. You'll find a lot of people who have money to do this, but you don't know why they have it. And you don't know what they want you to do. Like I had a situation where I had to turn down some money. It was like, I wanted that money, but Jack, I don't even know what you about to ask me at the end of the day. So, and you know, when <laughs> you're like, when you're a legally, um, you know, licensed, dispensary yeah. your your finances are extremely scrutinized oh, yeah. all your investors yeah. at least in my state you have all the investors more than five percent have to go through a full financial background check a full um uh criminal background check federally um their rules around it it's, it's very difficult and then on top of it i cannot take money from just anyone it no. has to be an accredited investor you know i have, still have to apply by sec regulations i can't crowdfund you know, so there's just, it's very difficult. And my family and friends that are like, hey, I want to invest. I want to give you $5,000. I can't take that. So it gets difficult. Yeah, it's like a want, want, want moment. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, like, yeah. like, you can't take that. That's, mm, mm, yeah, I can't mm. take that. Um, I know, <laughs> you know, you, and you should know this by being in, um, being an economics major and being in finance, is that finding mentors is a very important yes. thing for you to do. Um, and I'm pretty sure you had to do that when you were going through your first part of your career. Um, now that you're in this career of cannabis, have you been looking towards mentors? Have people been coming to you about trying to possibly help you navigate through some of these waters? Definitely. Okay. Um, I definitely get... I'm approached often from people um, that have money or, you know, maybe they've created a consulting firm mm. or something like that. I just have to be really careful. Like you said, you have to be careful who you take money yeah. from, what their motives are, all of those things. Um, but I definitely have had a lot of really great people that didn't want anything from me and that just wanted to help me or uh, wanted to partner me, with me for, on different things. But I'd say my mother and I have, have stayed pretty tight and it's, and it's us right now. And we're definitely at the point um, now that it's been about a year. It's been a little over a year that we've been operational, that we're ready to kind of take it to the next level, Good. Um, which means we're going to have to raise money. Yeah. And I was going to ask you about that. The next level. Like, what do you see? What areas of growth do you do you see um, could be possible for Mary and Maine? Like, I was thinking possibly about franchising and things yeah. like that. Like, do you feel like that's part of something you're going to do soon? Definitely. Um, franchising is, is definitely something that we're thinking about. So there's a lot of different things we can do a lot of different ways. Uh, we thought about getting into uh, cultivation and processing mm. um, to become vertically integrated. Um, we've thought about going and applying in different states. We've also thought about the franchising model, which I really, really like because I feel like that gives us the opportunity to help other minorities get into yes. this industry yeah. and be a part of what we're doing and then use our already proven business systems and our already proven business model and our brand that's already established to build their own businesses. Yeah. So I really like the franchising model. That is something we're definitely going to uh, pursue. Uh, we're also going to be applying for other licenses in other states. But as far as kind of um, becoming vertically integrated or um, joining in and partnering, we're kind of still weighing those options. You know, and, and vertically integrated. I speak about that often, especially yeah. when it comes to cash color cannabis. But speak about that, what it means in, in, in your world of cannabis, when it comes yeah. from your dispensary to the actual growing of your own product. Like speak what, what being vertically integrated means on that level. 
Well, being vertically integrated in any industry is almost, you know, it, it's important in any industry. Yes. Um, because then you're able to control your supply chain. Most mm -hmm. of the time you can control your pricing. So it's super important in any industry, but in cannabis, it's extremely important because right now, while it's still federally illegal and every state has its individual frameworks, you know, if you're not vertically integrated in a state, especially in a state that has very limited licenses, you can get, I mean, you could get black, you know, blackballed, yeah. uh, you, you can get, there's just so many things that can happen. And me right now, I'm a one-off dispensary in Maryland. I'm not associated with any of the growers in Maryland. All the big guys are in Maryland. Um, so, you know, like this summer, we experienced a little bit of a supply problem. You know, they, I'm not sure what happened, probably just the weather being so crazy yeah. and not being able to regulate um, the indoor warehouses and stuff. I think people just had shortage of of, of product this summer and I got hit with that because I'm not associated with the grower so you know when a grower is having a shortage the first people they're going to supply are their own dispensaries yes yes and then to me it's like you know you're not getting any discounts and all that and then those dispensaries are able to run better sales have more product all of these things so it makes it really difficult for one-off dispensaries to survive and then on top of that the biggest thing about it is um 280e so 280E is a tax law that regulates all illegal businesses, not just cannabis, but any illegal business that wants to pay taxes. Okay. And I don't know what other elite, illegal businesses. That's what I'm thinking. Businesses. Yeah, want to pay taxes. It happened before in the 80s. So that's why this, this law came about. Um, somebody was doing some illegal stuff and still wanted to pay Uncle Sam. So that was very admirable. So now we have this law that says that we cannot deduct normal uh, business expenses, normal and ordinary business expenses, except for COGS. So as a retail operation, you can only deduct the cost of your product. You cannot deduct your employees. You cannot deduct your... Oh, you're losing money. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> oh, it, you're effectively, losing our tax yeah. rate is about 80%. Yeah, so you, it blitzed. becomes really difficult. The name of the game is stay alive until... Uh, well, prohibition is. I was done. gonna say legalization. Yeah, just kind of try to. Yeah, keep that's your head the name above of water. the game. Keep your head above water. Yeah. Expand. That's why expansion is important. That's why you see these big guys going out and winning licenses as many as they possibly can, mm -hmm. so that they can raise more money, raise and do more, and have all this. And they have extremely high cash burns, so yeah. that they can survive. But they're able to raise money at much higher rates, so they can do that. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure that. Um, yeah, have you thought about somebody like actually coming on and helping you from that level? Like it probably will take somebody like you being affiliated with a grower eventually like have you thought yeah. about being that one um it's either going to be me that um i have to become vertically integrated or what's going to happen is yeah i'm going to have to i'm definitely going to have to partner with someone okay yeah well, I, well, I definitely, I'm, de I'm very impressed by the the actual growth of Mary and Maine. You know, Thank like you. from from the minute I heard about, actually, the first time I heard about you, was it? Were you on TV? Yeah. <laughs> I was. I believe it was, yeah, because I believe I got an email, and it was the craziest email. They said, somebody's going to be on a reality show, also they own a dispensary. And I'm like, how does, what? You know, it was yeah, almost like the most ridiculous really thing. Yeah, we didn't really get, we didn't touch on it at all. Uh, you would have never known I owned a dispensary, okay. maybe unless you read the description of me on the website mm -hmm. of the show. They had like a little snippet like, and she also owns a dispensary. They never showed it on the show or anything. But I feel like, what was this, like two years ago? Yeah. It might have been a little bit too early for people to really kept, wrap their head and around. And that network, too. It, it came on it. E. Yeah. So that network wasn't quite ready oh, yet, no, even though, no, you know, no. the Kardashians had their little episodes in their dispensaries and all that stuff. But, you know, I'm not a Kardashian. Oh, yeah, the Kardashians so. basically wrong. They, they turn the lights on at E. Yeah, <laughs> like, definitely, like, for that, sure. So. That is their <laughs> channel, hands down about that. Mm -hmm. So um, um, let's speak. How do we make more Hope Wisemans? You know, uh, we, we spoke briefly about how you are the youngest dispensary, um, African-American dispensary owner in the, in the country, basically mm -hmm. the world. Like, I mean, I mean for real. Probably. <laughs> like, she's in the world, yeah. Craig, at this moment. <laughs> but we actually need more views. And we, we need more views, and we need you not to be the youngest by next year. Yeah. How do we create more views? So what we really need are – so th what, what is really – uh, furthering the industry right now is venture capital money, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, like a few years ago, you saw a lot of articles coming out about how there were so many men, women involved in this industry, and it was one of the the fastest growing um, industries for women. Yeah. You know, and then all of a sudden, 
few years later, you see the decline happen super quick. You I see had it questions go from about like, that from the jump. Yep, it, it goes from, <laughs> wow, you know, women are, are about 35% of mm-hmm. the ownership of this industry down to like 20 in two years. Yes. What happened was now venture capitalists start to, to believe in the industry more. And they actually see, okay, this is serious, and I see where this is going. I believe in it now, right? Yeah. So as soon as venture capitalists came in, all the money shifted. The money started going immediately to those companies where most venture capitalists would normally invest. And then historically, throughout, throughout all industries, black women are the least likely category to be invested by, by venture capitalists because yeah. most venture capitalists are white, older men, and they cannot see a relation to someone like me. Yeah. Hey, could you go so, downstairs and get Hollywood? I'm sorry. Could somebody go downstairs and get Hollywood? She's stuck. You know, so, but, you know, I, I actually, I remember when that, when that narrative was being pushed. And I thought it was really good narrative, but what I thought it was was a setup. Yeah. Be- because I'm like, how many of these businesses, because I'm meeting a lot of people at this time, how many of these businesses, their only employee is them? Like, there's not really a business here. This is something you're starting. So you're, you're throwing all these people into this percentage. And like you said, all it's yeah. going to do is hype people up with real money to come in. And when real money come in, they flushing all that out the window. Oh, because it's all gone. You don't even have a business. Like, you have no people with you. <laughs> and I yeah. think that was a lot of it. I think yeah. it was a lot of hype at first. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, once all that money started getting pushed into the industry, and now you have people that are so well capitalized. You have companies that have hundreds of millions of dollars of cash in yeah. the bank. They have plans to have a, you know, they're spending 200% of their revenue on expenses and they have plans to do that for the next five years. <sighs> Look, so it, how it, do you compete? It's hard. You know, you got people like, well, for one, you got somebody like John Boehner one day pulling up and then you got somebody yeah. like Jay-Z, you know? <laughs> like at what? Going to the other side. Yeah, I mean. And, Jay-Z didn't come and partner with an African-American company. He I thought about to, that, but I was like, but who would he? And, and be, be completely honest with you. He who could have could made he? a company. I, you know, that's really my opinion yeah. on what he did. I feel like everything that he's going to do with the company that he signed with, he could have taken a company like mine. It didn't have to be me. Mm. But he could have taken a company like mine, put $50 million behind it, and blew it up. I feel you. I felt that way about cash. I was like, look, if anything, Jay, you should be over here with Cash Color Cannabis. Like, dog, yeah, we should, should really be there. He should be doing stuff with African-American brands but at the same time you know somebody has to get in there and really advocate for Mm -hmm. us i hope in the future he takes the position that he'll have with being with this company because this company that he's with is huge Mm -hmm. and they're doing really well so hopefully he can um progress himself in this industry and then come back and reach down and and have his hand out again what i want to see hove be able to do is actually show a a, a actual power of hip-hop in cannabis you know because we have snoop i think snoop is actually really powerful but he plays it so far to the back like it's almost to the point where how they even connect mary jane with snoop dogg is almost like come on there's nothing on here hip-hop you know what i'm saying like almost nothing on here hip-hop two you gotta like you gotta realize at this point the commercialization of cannabis has happened yes okay so it's, it's, it's extremely corporatized at this point. And the people who are, um, you know, running these billion dollar companies, the first cannabis billionaire has been made, okay? The CEO of, of Cureleaf is a billionaire, okay? That's just the first one. These companies are already worth billions of dollars. Yeah. So those guys are not uh, hip hop guys. Not at all. Okay? So all. I'm just. And, and Jay Z has the ability to be able to sit at the table with those guys. Yeah. So I just feel like, you know, he has to be able to leverage that because your average African American doesn't have the opportunity to sit at those no. tables. No, and also I want you, I think, that, I think Jay's in a good position because I don't think Jay, I think Jay actually cares about the business. Where you got people like Wiz and them, I don't think they even care about the business necessarily. Like they just really cool being where they're at. Yeah. And they don't never necessarily leverage some of their ability. Like, like even I would bring up another person, Burner. Burner figured out a way to really leverage his brand like cookies kk khalifa kush is actually a good name brand but it's like it's nowhere close to cookies you know i mean mean? cookies is like the he takes that serious the the one staple cannabis brand that most people know white black Mm -hmm. you know recreational medical so cookies is even going to be in maryland soon and maryland's a straight medical state um, he got a he got a partnership with a brand out in Maryland. Takes like it cookies serious. is going to be everywhere. Takes it serious. I think Two Chains is the next one to take it serious. Yeah, like, I'm Two Chains is, is a is a smart businessman. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm, I'm nervous about Chains. Makes me nervous. When I saw he, <laughs> oh, he picked up um, A3 Seed, I was like, okay, Chains yeah, is really really getting playing. close. Yeah, yeah. He what's his his brand is called Gas, Gas. or something. Yeah, yeah. which. 
it's oddly close to Gas House. I don't like look, it. It's oddly close to the most generic name. And I was yeah. like, if you look at <laughs> Green, and I don't want to name names because I know it, I feel like it's, a, it's Green Street Marketing puts them out. And I'm like, why are y'all giving these rappers these most generic names like Trees by Game, like right, Gas like, by Two Chains, like what yeah, are, Gas. We didn't think but, about nothing. We didn't do a market research study at all. Just <laughs> just grab the name. Well, they and did with because it. they did, and they know that the urban communities will immediately gas. I know what that is. Yeah. That's what that's about. Yeah, you know what's funny though? I remember the first reaction on Instagram and yeah, we know what that is. And we what we know is why do you have levels of of, of what was it, regular, mid, and premium? Like who that we don't want the other two. I never <laughs> will I who? never want to smoke a mid. Uh uh-uh, uh, we don't want the other two. I don't you could have left those out. Yeah. But I take it back. You know what? I will say now that I operate a dispensary, the demographics that come into dispensaries are just so interesting. Mm. Um, it's not <laughs> what you think. Okay. Um, out of my dispensary, I'd probably say 60% of my patients are over the age of 55. Do they, are they consuming and flour? Or are they yeah, edibles? I'd say mostly flour. Um, mm. The next highest category in my store are cartridges. Mm. And then after that, um, chewables, a lot of people like chewables in my store, tablets. Mm. Um, topicals and tinctures. Um, concentrates are, are are still not as popular in my store, but I'm mm. I'm kind of located at in an urban community. I'm not a concentrate person, and I feel like that's still they something that has, has to be sold to us in a different package. Because I I keep seeing corrupt brother passing out, like de- trying to dab on that. I don't know if you've seen the video <laughs> on World Star with with corrupt brother Roscoe is taking a dab and he starts hitting it and he coughs three times and he just passes out and knocks out. <laughs> and at first time I saw that, I told him I ain't dabbing. Like Stanley keeps trying to give me the dab. And I'm like, bro, I'm not so doing it. So the only time that I've ever really dabbed was when I was in like serious pain, like when I was prescribed opioids. Oh. So, so it, you, it's they a knocked good, you out. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, not knock me out, but like it, it helped with the pain. I'd say it, it's just really concentrated. It's concentrated. It's very concentrated. So it's extremely strong. Um, it's not for everyday use. Um, or if it is in very, very small increments or higher CBD versions and THC. But I mean, people are dabbing like you know, 90% THC, I, I can't do it. You Mm-mm. know, I'm not a fan. And there's been a lot of studies that say, um, you know, things that are that concentrated and isolates that are 90% and all that stuff are not the best for you. No. So Think about 90% cocaine. Like, that's not good much. for you. Yeah, <laughs> you know that's saying? not it, good for you. Put it at, in, at, in those contexts. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's insanity, man. So what's yeah. the most popular product there at, at, the, at the Definitely at the flour. Really? Um, Is there a strain in particular? Uh, yeah, there's a few strains that people like. People in my store like uh, Dosi Dough, um, get a lot of Diesel Dough. That's another one that people like in my store. But a lot of people like names that they recognize, okay. Sour Diesel. Of course. You know, OGs, any OGs, any Cushes, they like those. That's me. I'm walking in. Any dispensary I walk into, I'm walking in. Give me an OG. Give yeah. me an OG. Give me an OG. But I you have to realize now, too, I really, we, especially, it's a medical dispensary, right? Mm-hmm. So my, um, we call them experience agents, but most people would identify with butt tenders. I like that name, experience agents. Experience agents. That's yeah, because up. we call our, our dispensary floor the yeah. experience room. See, that's somebody who's been in business before. Like that, I like that name, experience Yeah, agent. the experience That's agents. like Apple. Exactly. Like the Apple well, originally <laughs> we had kind of like an Apple idea, mm-hmm. you know, originally. So that's probably where it came from. Um, and I just really want people to feel comfortable, whether you're young, old, whatever you do, whether you're a professional, whether you're an entrepreneur, I want you to feel comfortable in my, in my spot. And I want you to feel like you can ask questions. So um, I train all my experienced agents to be able to speak to the terpene profiles and the cannabinoid profiles rather than the actual names of the strains. Yes, let people know what they're actually doing. What versus, they're actually yeah, doing. And then yeah. get them to understand you know, how it works in their body. I need them to understand that, look, how something affects you is not going to be the same way it affects someone else. No. We all have different endocannabinoid systems, and we try and introduce that to them in the very in the most simple way mm-hmm. in the beginning. Um, and I'm really excited. Now, you know, there are tests coming out that kind of tell you uh, what your, uh, your typical endocannabinoid system balance is, which is yeah, so man. dope. I think, that, I think that's dope, too. Like, let me get yeah. to the point of what I want to do. Yeah, and then you just know. It's like, yeah, look, yeah. I react well to high CBN. Yeah. You know, it's like, who would know that? You know, and, it's, and everyone's so caught up on, like, you know, uh, in the beginning, we had a lot of patients coming in, like, what's the highest THC flower 
that you have for the cheapest. <laughs> like that was the <laughs> statement. Like what's the cheapest, highest THC? And I'm like, look, just because something is 30% THC doesn't mean that it's going to work well with your body. And just because you deal with something that's 15% THC doesn't mean I've, I've smoked things that are 15% THC mm. versus 30 and the 15% THC worked better for me than the 30. I believe that, you know, yeah. but again, we, we, it, it, it takes more learning on our half, on our behalf to really understand the full, imp, the full level, of, the full level and full power of the plant. And yeah. I feel like a lot of us just haven't really opened up to um, experiencing it totally. You know, right. there's still people out here who really haven't understood good weed, you know, yeah. like, <laughs> like to be completely honest with you. And that's, that's the, that's the even the more killer, man. Yeah. So what are we going to see you at next? Oh, actually, actually, before I ask you that one, um, social equity. Uh-huh. That's a big conversation right now, clearly. Um, it was part of my conversation this past, this, this past weekend. I really believe that when we talk about social, when we talk about anything in, involving people of color getting an actual place or actual standing, I think media is the first place you yeah. need to go, honestly. And I think that laws and everything else, they change by the day. We're going to politicians change by the day. But Jet Magazine, Ebony Magazine were there for, for, 11, for a long, long, long time. And they gave us a huge platform when nobody else would get that platform. Mm -hmm. um, what's, your, what's your idea when it comes to social equity? Like, what do you think the best ways and the best methods are going about it when it comes to cannabis and making sure that people are insured? Well, not insured, but people are, are getting information. They are getting themselves a step into the door, and they are getting themselves a chance up. Yeah. So I think media is extremely important. Mm -hmm. um, I've definitely utilized the platform that I have yep. um, to be able to bring awareness to it. That being said, um, to, to be able, right now we have this unique opportunity for the next few years, especially as more states are coming on board and states are fixing their programs that are already in existence. Yep. We have this unique opportunity to actually influence the laws yes, um, yes, that man. are being, that are shaping this industry. And now is the time that we can ensure that you know, the, the, the discussion is being heard from that perspective and being written into the laws. Mm -hmm. Yes, they can change, but maybe that's our way to get our foot in the door. Yes. Um, you know, I know right now, Maryland just, uh, which is the state that I operate in, Maryland just, uh, or they, they had an application process that was targeted specifically around women and minority-owned businesses because in the first round, they did not license any women or minorities for grows and processing, yeah. which are extremely valuable companies. Yes, yes, You yes. can sell the piece of paper after you win a grow. At this point in the game right now, while we're still early before federal legalization, as soon as you win a grow license, you can sell the piece of paper for $20 million. Mm. So, and that's me mm. being conservative and very, that's, that's very conservative. We all need to go in on a grow. <laughs> it's difficult like though. They're not. It's yeah. they're not giving it to you. I'll no, say you that. I'll tell you that. They're no. not giving it to you. You know, and I, um, <laughs> I'm I'm from Boston. You know, so when I ever go home, I had a chance to go see my cousins. I got a cousin who owns a smoke shop. I got another cousin who literally has a grow in his basement. You know, and I'm yeah. I'm watching so many changes happen in this city, and I'm nervous. And I remember telling my my cousin that. And I, as a matter of fact, I had a chance to speak with Chanel Lindsay about it as well. Yeah. Things I get nervous about when it comes to Boston is. I want to make sure that people who I know did a lot of time or had to waste a lot of time in jail, you know what I'm saying, been going back and forth over these laws, gets a chance really to get in these doors. And I do, it does sound like something to me that I, I could hear me being against. Like, I don't, I'm not big on just letting people do things, but this is something yeah. I feel like actually is needed. There's no way we could actually, with a, with, with a clear conscience, make money while you know people are getting arrested for this. Story. And there are people, people sitting still in sitting in jail right now. No way. There's no way with a clear it conscience. It bothers me could. sometimes, you know, I think about like when we get those big <laughs> deliveries, we might get, you know, we might get 15 pounds delivered at once, you know, and I'm like sitting in the room with 15 pounds. And well, I'm you're the plug like, now. Yeah, you know, I'm, just, I'm, I'm sitting there with 15 pounds and I'm looking like, that's crazy. Like, there's a guy sitting in jail right now that had probably 100 pounds yeah. with him, you know, and, I, and, and was doing it well. And I think yeah. to myself, if you really... I mean, not everybody who's sitting in jail this applies to, but like if you can run a high level operation, if you had a lot of people under you, you probably, mm -hmm. with some help, could run a compliant Fact. business now. Fact. So, I mean, it's going to take people like me that already have our foot in the door to, to fight for it. And I definitely, I get tired. I get overwhelmed with, I'm, I'm really trying to run my business and survive. <laughs> but then I feel like, you know, it's my duty to, to, to advocate for those who can't advocate for themselves because who else is going to do it? Yeah, yeah. I'm glad I, I'm glad I met you this weekend. Yeah, let's, you. let's advocate together, <laughs> man. What are we going to see you in 10 years? Oh, man. So I hope 
Well, no, I know by in 10 years, I plan to build a pretty uh, decent sized portfolio okay. of, of cannabis companies and have sold it. <laughs> I like that idea. Um, that is build that it to sell, build man. it and sell it. Yeah. Um, unless unless it, some, it starts going really, really well and I see the pathway to going public. Um, but most likely I'll end up selling and I hope to be doing um, some high level business development for a big cannabis company and then doing philanthropy on the side and maybe some real estate or something. Man, she had that plan. Oh yeah, I got that plan. <laughs> yeah, that plan. but you have to. I mean, this industry you is do. so doggy dog, like you, you do. can't do it without a plan. You do, you do. So if somebody wanted to stop by and see Mary, um, Mary in Maine or if they wanted to get some more information about it, where would they go? Yeah, so you can uh, follow the company at Mary in Maine. Um, that is M-A-R-Y-A-N-D-M-A-I-N. Um, also, you can check out our website at marionmain.com. And then if you want to follow me and all the things that I'm doing personally, my Instagram is I am hope so dope. Um, exactly <laughs> how it's spelled it all really the way is. through. Yep. Um, and then my personal website, Hope Wiseman, and it's spelled like wise man. Dot com. Oh, you know what? Make sure you get her inst Instagram correct. There is a hope. There is a hope is dope, but it's not her. Not hope is dope. Ho <laughs> I am hope so dope. Hope, I, <laughs> I thank you for coming by today. It was thank a great you so interview. Much hey, for having me. Before you go, I got a gift for you. I want to give you one of our <laughs> Meet the Dealer shirts. I gave you a Ronald Reagan. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. It says drug lord. Yeah, I gave, you a, I gave you a Ronald Reagan drug lord. <laughs> With shirt. Reagan. With the thumbs up. Yeah, man. It's yeah, awesome. Man. I love it. Yeah, he brought us he brought us a lot of a lot of memories, man. We're all oh, here man. now. Oh man, yeah, we're here <laughs> now. Yeah, I wanna we need to talk later. Yeah. Later. Yeah. yeah. In the next life. I appreciate you for coming out. Thank you. Thank y'all everybody for coming through and checking out this interview on a Monday night. And I'm that's Cash Color Cannabis, a high level of conversation on live hip hop daily TV. Founded in 2015. Peak Relief is the premier landing spot for your medical marijuana needs in Maryland. Not built by national consultants or businesses, but by friends with a dream to return home and create a better dispensary. Located at 2001 Chapman Ave in Rockville, Maryland, stop by Peak Relief and see what they have in store for you.